Hey folks, this is um, DSM 11, Life at the Ocean's Edge. So today we are going to be talking about the intertidal zone. So we've already talked about this. You read a textbook reading about the intertidal zone and we discussed it in class. Um, today we're going to explore a little bit more about the organisms that live in the intertidal zone. So you may or may not remember, because <laughs> it's been a long time since you were in school, that the intertidal zone is located at the edge of the ocean between the highest high tide line and the lowest low tide line. So basically wherever the water comes up to during high tide and then wherever the water retreats to during low tide is the intertidal zone. So the intertidal zone can be rocky, it can be sandy, it can be marshy, it can be muddy. I bet you can imagine, or maybe you have even been to some of these different types of shorelines. I think of the rocky shore when I think of the intertidal zone up here because I think about those waves pounding against the rocks and the water coming up and over and filling some of those tide pools and then retreating and then there's maybe just a little bit of water left. But in those tide pools are all kinds of organisms that you can see and explore. And look at. So within the intertidal zone, the cycle of exposure to air varies, and that's just one of the harsh environmental conditions that these organisms need to live in. The exposure to air, the exposure to sun, the salinity, even, all of these different environmental conditions can change for organisms. So there are four different habitat bands that have been identified in the intertidal, intertidal zone. The spray zone or the splash zone, which is rarely covered completely by water, only during the highest high tides. The organisms living there need the salty spray of ocean water, but would not thrive if submerged. Number two is the high tide zone, which is exposed most of the time in underwater only during high tides. And then number three, the mid-tide zone, is regularly covered and uncovered by the twi tide twice a day. This area is underwater about half the time. And then the fourth um, different, or the fourth zone would be the low-tide zone, which is submerged for all but a few hours each month during the lowest low tides. So depending on the location, the range of the tidal zones can be small or great. In flat areas, maybe such as this, um, the muddy shore or the sandy shore, the tide can spread over smooth open beaches. Um, it may rise and fall only a few inches each day, and the intertidal zone is broad but set but shallow. Where the tide cannot spread out, such as up here in this rocky shore, the high tide could be over 70 feet higher than the low tide, but the intertidal zone might be very narrow. Each type of zone is home to organisms that have adapted to their environment in some remarkable ways. And most intertidal animals stay in the zone that supplies the amount of water, food, and air that they need. Some though do move from zone to zone. So one way in which animals are adapted to the pounding breakers, the hot sun, the rain, the snow, and even sometimes ice of the tidal area is by having a hard exterior. And those are the animals that we are going to talk about today. So here are a couple more slides for you. We are talking about animals that live on coastline pounded by surf twice a day. Who could possibly live there? So the animals that we're going to be talking about are soft bodied, but live inside shells. So what are shells and where do they come from? Well, shells are the hard remains of once living sea animals. Mollusks are the animals that live or lived in those shells. They are called mollusks, mollusks because the word mollusk means soft bodied. Now I know that you are looking at this red text on your screen and you are probably quickly turning to the notes portion of your oceans packet. Um, I just want to remind you that since you are watching this video at home, you are more than welcome to pause the video and then restart it once you're done taking your notes. I am not going to build in time to the video for that just, be, just because of, I mean, that would just add a lot of data 
and take up more bandwidth. So I just expect that you will be pausing the videos when you need to, to be able to take notes. Okay, so back to mollusks. Mollusks are animals that are soft bodied. Well, if you look at this little snail right here, you can imagine that that snail living in the intertidal zone would get pounded and crushed if it did not have something to protect its soft body. So, of course, that is what the purpose of a shell is going to be. The shell protects the soft body of the animal inside. Now, just like you and I, these animals, mollusks, have skeletons. The difference, though, is that their skeleton is on the outside of their body. Mollusks have exoskeletons, and I, I'm sure that you are familiar with this term, that you've heard it in past grades. So just like our skeleton is on the inside and gives support to our muscles and our flesh and protects our vital organs, mollusk skeletons are on the outside. These protect the soft body of the animal that lives inside of it. So we are going to talk about two types of mollusks today. We are going to talk about bivalves first. And I hope that you um, either printed or opened a sep in a separate window the bivalve and univalve fact sheets that can be found attached to the classroom assi assignment that you opened up to start viewing this video. You're going to need those in just a second. So if you don't have those available, go ahead and open those up now. But let's talk about bivalves first. Bi means two. And I want you to think in your mind about some examples that you have seen of bivalve shells. And you might have thought of clams or oysters or maybe even some others. So bivalves are shells that come in pairs or in twos. Bivalve shells are hinged at the back. So these, these are made up of two hinged shells that, can, that fit together and can be opened and closed by the animal that lives between them. Bivalves are tasty. <laughs> People like to eat clams and mussels and oysters. All of those things are bivalves. <laughs> bivalves use their muscles to open and close their shells. They open their shells to let food and water in, and then they close their shells to rest or protect themselves. Um, if you want, can take a look at this diagram right here, you can see um, a couple different things. These tube-like siphons up here are where bivalves will take in their food and water. So they take in the water through one tube, and from the water, the animal will absorb oxygen and filter microscopic food particles. Wastewater is going to leave through the other siphon tube, so down through here and then up through here. So most bivalves live in sand or mud, although some attach themselves to rocks and pilings. Pilings are those supports underneath bridges. Most move by extending and then contracting their large muscular foot, although some can move through a kind of jet propulsion, basically, by opening and then clamping shut their shells. Large colonies of bivalves are often referred to as beds. So this is where the term oyster bed comes from. Oyster beds are basically farmed colonies of oysters, but I believe they also do that in nature as well. So what I'd like you to do right now is go back to that last slide here. I'll flash it up here on the screen for you. And when um, I stop talking, then you can pause the video and you're going to label the siphon tubes, the muscular foot, and the hinge in the diagram of the bivalve on your activity sheet 11, part A in your oceans packet. So go ahead and pause the video now and complete that task and then start the video again when you're ready. Okay, hopefully you've completed that task. The next thing I'm gonna have you do is using the bivalve fact sheet that is attached to the assignment, assignment in Google Classroom, I'm going to have you match the pictures of shells, and I'll show you those pictures um, on the next slide, to the descriptions on the fact sheet. Then you're going to draw an outline of each shell and label it. So basically you're going to read through that fact sheet. It's going to give you several different types of bivalves, 
and you are going to look at this next slide here it is right here and you are going to de decide which picture is which item from your bivalve facts fact sheet. So go ahead and pause the video and that's probably going to take you about five to ten minutes. So go ahead and do that and then come back. All right, did you draw some little outlines that look like the animals on the screen? Hopefully you drew something that looks like a clam up here. Um, these are clams and this is a clam right here as well. I don't know why my pen's not working. There it goes. Um, and then we have a picture of an oyster and a picture of a scallop. Okay, moving on. Let's talk about univalves. So univalves are soft-bodied mollusks whose shells form a spiral or a cone shape. And you guessed it, univalves are made up of only one shell in contrast to bivalves. Uni, uni means one, so these shells are only going to be one piece. Univalves have just one shell. If you didn't get a chance to copy those notes, go ahead and pause and do that now. Univalve, let me go back here, just give you a little bit more time to hit pause. Okay, moving on. Univalves are also called gastropods. And I think this is really funny because gastro means stomach and pod means foot. So basically, univalves are stomach feet. So, all univalves are gastropods, but not all gastropods are univalves. For example, slugs. Um, slugs do not have, they do have an exoskeleton, a small one, but they don't have like an outside spiral or cone shell. Gastropods are very abundant. They are outnumbered in the animal kingdom only by insects, if you can believe that. Univalves have a well-developed head with eyes, a mouth, and tentacles, just like ordinary pond or land snails. They also have a rough, scraping tongue called a radula, which they use to shred vegetable or animal matter. Many univalves live among rocks and coral reefs, while others dwell in the shallow water along sandy shores. Like bivalves, they have one or more siphon tubes and move by extending and contracting their muscular foot. To protect themselves, they retract their soft bodies into their shells and seal the opening with a horning plug called an operculum. Okay, so now what I'd like you guys to do is you are going to, on that picture of the univalve at the top of activity sheet 11, part B, you are going to label the eyes, the tentacles, the mouth, the foot, the siphon tube, and the operculum that's in the diagram. Now, I realize that you don't have anything to look at and that you are doing this based on the description that you just um, got it, it, when we went through the slides. And so what I'd like you to do is give that a try and then I am going to attach a key for part B to the classroom attachments. So it'll be attached to this assignment. So I want you to try and before you check the key. All right, so after you've done that, you're going to use the univalve fact sheet and you are going, going to find and label each type of shell on the activity sheet. Okay, so basically that univalve fact sheet has descriptions of each of these shells and what you'll do is look at the pictures on your activity sheet 11 part B and you're going to match those written descriptions with the pictures that you that you see there and then you'll name each one of those shells and then again you can check your work after you're finished and then after you finish that please answer the questions on the bottom of the page okay so just recapping what we've learned today today we talked about the intertidal zone and more specifically about some types of animals that live in the intertidal zone Today we talked about bivalves and we talked about univalves. We spoke about how bivalves are creatures that are made up of two hinged shells, um, such as clams, scallops, and oysters. And we talked about how they use their muscles to open and close their shells, then that they take food and water in through their siphon tubes, filtering out oxygen and microscopic food particles to feed themselves, and then they send wastewater through that other siphon tube. And we talked about how most of them live in sand or mud. Then we talked about univalves, and we talked about how univalves are made up of a single cone or spiral-shaped shell 
that that single shell protects the soft body and mollusk inside and that univalves um, have a funny second name which is gastropod <laughs> Um, and hopefully you will in just a moment go ahead and stop the video and use that univalve fact sheet to label the different types of shells on your page and answer the questions at the end. Okay, well that is it for science today, folks. Um, I hope you all are doing well and any questions that you might have, I hope that you are keeping a notebook so that you can ask me those questions during our checkout time at the end of the day. All right, that's it.